We thank you for wisdom. Help us. Everyone's going through so much stuff, Lord. We just thank you for no fear. You said to fear not. So, Father, we thank you for no fear that we know where the fear porn's coming from. We don't allow our emotions to get involved with a lot of the YouTuber people that are trying to scare people. Yeah. We're in the end times, but we, we refuse to give place to the spirit of fear because you told us to fear not. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to start thanking someone from Canada that wants us to pray for Canada. And I was glad to hear from Canada because it's been a while. Uh, from There's a bill, I um, can't even read my writing, I think it's C-367, or else it's G-367, one of these bills. And the big deal is uh, it threatens Christian speech. You're arrested for quoting portions of the Bible in public. And they're asking, should pastors be charged with hate crimes when preaching against certain sins? And think about that word sins, because we're going to talk about some things, because they're trying to pass other laws, which they are not calling them sins. They're calling them diseases. They call them attractions, uh, different things that um, this pyramid is not getting better <laughs> as far as the world goes. And in Second Timothy, open your Bibles there, please, to chapter 3. We're living in perilous times, and it's, I believe it's the beginning of sorrows. Like I shared a couple years ago, when a lot of these things started happening, we see the reset, we see the things that are happening, and the people that don't want to see it are not going to see it, but the people that see it, you can't unsee what's happening. And so they want to pass this bill, and um, I've taught on this, I think, since 2015, about the hate crimes they want to pass. They can just push anything through, and then will they shut down churches that doesn't, uh, let's call it the G-O-V, uh, doesn't approve of their beliefs. So that's a huge thing, and as you know, this is a one world situation, so even though things happen in other countries, this is the global plan, and that's why we're, we're talking about... Uh, perilous times, understanding the times that we're living in, hard times. But with all that, we are not to be afraid, we're not to back down, and we are to endure. And we are to um, be able to endure to the end because we have the Holy Spirit and He gives us power every day to make choices. And so we can choose to live in fear and defeat or we can choose uh, today's the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it, right? There's a lot of things we cannot control that are happening around us, but we can choose. We have choices to make every single day, and we want to make right choices. And one of the things that the United States, that's Canada, but the United States is deeper in debt than any nation in the history of the world. And what does that mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a trophy for that is right. Uh, problems on the way for America. And this old guy I was listening to is 81 years old, and he moved to Asia, actually, and he said he saw this stuff was happening to America, and he said, it's very good to be an old American right now. <laughs> it's not good to be a young American. So our grandchildren, we need to really pray for our kids. I can't even go there. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, we all know this scripture, and let's get into this. Um, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now that word perilous, and I've shared on this before, it also means it's the same word as in Matthew 8. There's only two times that it mentions this. And it's the... Sorry, it's Matthew 8. Uh, Matthew 8, 28... It's the same word here, perilous times. It also means fierce. And this was talking about demonic activity. And we are seeing it. There was an active gun shooter just a couple miles away from our house last week. We're hearing this and that. We're in perilous times, aren't we? Where people are giving place to demonic spirits, people that don't know the Lord, people that are just going crazy. 
it's hard to even see it, but Jesus warned us of these things. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of it. And in verse 28 in Matthew 8, it says, And then he was come to the other side into the country of the Gazarees. Their men him, he, there met him, two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce. That word fierce there is also the same word perilous in Second Timothy. And they were so fierce that no man might pass them by. And they were tormented. The devil screamed out. And you know they eventually got cast into the pigs. But that's the same word here in 2 Timothy 3. Know this, that in the last days, fierce times, perilous times shall come. And we're just going to stop on this one. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. There's so many other things. These are the characteristics of the people in these end times. They're going to be lovers of themselves. We've talked a lot about narcissism, narcissistic pastor, what happens when narcissism comes to the church, uh, what happens when narcissism comes to our government, what happens when we're being overrun by narcissism and they no longer call it narcissism because it's so common. But they're uh, loving their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemies, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What are we supposed to do from such turn away? It doesn't say embrace. It says from such turn away. So the same word perilous, it describes demon-possessed like wild animals. And just reading the news and seeing news titles, it's just, are we, where do we live? I mean, these things that we've never even dreamt that could happen. So it's a world that's very dangerous and chaotic. And we're seeing chaoticness when all the phones were down yesterday, a lot of them from a certain carrier, a lot of chaos. People couldn't get a hold of people, couldn't get their jobs done just some chaotic things that are happening. This would have never happened 20 years ago, 10 years. We would have never thought of these blackout things. It's a result of demonic activity. That word perilous is wild, fierce, dangerous, and wicked. I looked up a whole bunch of definitions and I kind of made my own. It's evil situations will be emotionally upsetting. We're seeing things now we have to tell our emotions to step back because we have to learn how to abide under pressure. And the Bible says, he that endures to the end shall be saved, right? So we don't escape, we don't run away, we endure. We learn how to handle pressure with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, with God-given friendships and friends, with truth, right? Because we are called to be a peculiar people. And that word peculiar is not what the world means today, you're peculiar you're odd, you're weird, it actually there means you are set apart. Amen. We are called to be separated and to be, diff this world is not our home, death is a door. Nobody wants to die, none of us want to die, we don't want to see anyone die, but that is the door to the next life. So we are not without hope in this life, but um, seeing people being taken before their time through deception, through a lot of the things that we've went through, so many things are going on. But he says, savage times, uncivilized or cruel, unpredictable and hurtful. So the first thing in these end times that we are handling is the lovers of self. And when I started doing this study on what's a lover of self, they push God out. Mm -hmm. And they start loving themselves. And this is what happened to us back in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, with when we would go to church, organized religions and they made church all about you. It was all about you, your destiny, your dreams, your vision, a prophetic word. Everything became man-centered theology rather than preparing us for these times. The pastors were preparing us like an old used car salesman to, to get rich, get, get Christ in your life, and you can have this, 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 and this. All the benefits of this, instead of saying, you know, if you are Christian, you, you also have to prepare for persecution, for some hard times. Not just um, everything that the world in the church taught us. It taught us to be more worldly. It taught us to be covetous. 
It taught us to buy things and go in debt and look good. All that stuff doesn't matter, but it did back then. Uh, so lovers of self, they're forgetting God, they're pushing God out, where now the focus is our self. Now I'm going to talk about something that's a little touchy. And it's touchy because a lot of us don't understand what it is, but I'm saying it for a reason because of what we're going to move into, what the next thing is. Now we know about the inversion, but there's also things that are coming up that are going to be legal, that we need to protect our children against, mm -hmm. and they're going to say that it's uh, natural, and they're going to use psychology to do it. Mm -hmm. Now I say that because I have a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate, and I have a psychology <laughs> degree. So I'm saying this to myself. I'm not saying this to attack anyone. I know there's doctors on are you are online I've talked to them and I understand but we all have to understand that this is not what you think it is psychology is a whole different realm of what we thought it was we thought it was Christian we thought we could add the Bible to it but you have to understand that these people that developed this had no idea of God. they want to live a life away from God and to learn how to become their own savior their own quotes, and I will quote that to you. It's, I don't try to do anything without proof. So, um, the focus of modern psychology is self-love. Mm -hmm. Self-love, what does it lead to? It leads to self-deception. Because the Bible says we're supposed to pick up our cross and deny ourselves. The world says, love yourself. If it feels good, it's got to be right. Um, and a lot of the counseling that I've heard come out of, I've watched people, and it's, it's certain people, okay? And I've always loved to counsel people. Um, even in high school, I wasn't a Christian then, but people came to me with their problems. And I'd listen, and I'd try to figure out. They used to call it the pick, pick, dig, dig gift. You have such a pick, pick, dig. So I wanted to figure out why they acted the way they did. And I'd just sit and listen, and I'd want to, you know, help people. I've always had a desire to help people. So I thought this was a really good way to help people but then I started seeing people that were worse they got worse um, after they were going to certain people and cost them a lot of money and they got worse and they got um, hatred towards their parents they started getting inverted and thinking about their problems more and more and more they started thinking they had an inner child tell me where that is someone fought with me over this go find where in the Bible it says you have an inner child yeah, exactly. you have to renew your minds and I want to say we're all a mess. We're all a mess. And um, maybe I'll share a little bit more. But I don't like to share a lot of private things. None of you guys do, and it's not really important. But sometimes we need to share things. This is where we've come out of. And some of these things are not what we think they are. And sometimes you can get away with some of this stuff. But where we're going, you need to know what this is. And if you want to study more up on it, Dave Hunt, he's the one that wrote The Seduction of Christianity. He has a huge, it's about that thick on psychology, and I've been reading it. It's really small print, but if you want to study it more, uh, The Trojan Horse That Entered the Church, um, there's other articles on it, because what happens here is the self-love gets, um, it's huge. People are going to be lovers of themselves, and what they do is they start excusing things as diseases. You have this and this, and as, as a result of this, you are not responsible for how you're acting. It's your parents' fault. Mm -hmm. First of all, my parents were messed up. My mom got pregnant at 16 or 15. She had my brother at 16. My dad went to World War II. He came back an alcoholic and an abuser, a wife be beater, and abused all of us kids. There was a time that he actually kicked me across the floor, and I moved out and lived up with my other brother for a while. And I don't talk about that stuff because it's, it's choices we make now. Sure, I had a bad past. A lot of you had a, lot, a bad past. It took us down some bad places because we had to figure life out, right? But you can't live in unforgiveness and keep blaming your parents. You're blaming this person or blaming that one because blamers never grow. You're never going to grow if you blame. We have to forgive, and that doesn't mean you go back into it. Oh, I forgive you. Um, and I'm going to let you abuse me again. Sometimes you walk away, but you walk away with truth, and you walk away with a forgiving heart. You aren't duped again. 
but we all had bad things that we've lived through. We've all been messed up. But that doesn't give us the excuse to say, I'm going to be an alcoholic now because it's my dad's fault. We have uh, five kids in my family, we could all say that. Mm -hmm. I'm an alcoholic because my dad was, no, we all chose not to yeah. go that route. It's a choice. And um, now they're saying it's a disease. Well, it's really easy to say it's a disease because then you don't have to take responsibility. But every day you have a choice. We have choices in lots of things. But in Lovers of Ourself, and you go to these counselors, you, you have to be really careful who you allow in your life for truth. Not only counselors, but also pastors and leaders. There's good ones, there's bad ones. There's good police, there's bad ones. There's good uh, everything, but <clears throat> there's also bad. So you have to be careful that we're not so needy that we just want someone in our life to tell us what we want to hear. And we've all been there. We've all messed up. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nobody here that's not ashamed of something they've done in their life because of many different reasons. But we have to start saying, I choose today to serve the Lord, and I choose today not to do that anymore. Sometimes we're addicted to sin. We're addicted because it feels good. It feels good for a season. The Bible says sin is fun. It's fun for a season. But after that season's up, then you get the consequences. And God forgives you, but the consequences are still there, and you still have to deal with those consequences. But with a lot of this um, self, it's all about you. And you go to these people, and they just make you feel worse about yourself. They, you know, they, t they tell you that it's you know, your parents' fault problem, and you start getting really angry at your parents. It's over. It's done. I like to analyze things, too. But there comes to a point where you can talk and then you have to let things go. You can't just keep talking about the problem over and over and over again and pay $5,000 to do it every time you talk to someone. And it's so cool now to have a therapist. I mean, everybody wants one. But are they helping you? Okay, so that's a question. Are they? So self is on the throne. It's all about me. And then what happens, and what's the real danger is there's no conviction and then there's no repentance. So when we start motivationally speaking in our churches rather than preaching the Bible, there's no conviction. We should be convicted sometimes. Sometimes you're like, oh good, I can't wait for that person to hear that. But then when we hear something that, oh, I don't like that. <coughs> there's times we should be convicted. The word should convict us and make us want to change. That means we have a good conscience. But when you're told it's not your problem, it's someone else's and you're the way you are. We, and I understand, I was preaching on forgiveness years ago and this girl came up to me and she goes, uh, how do I forgive my dad for killing my mom? And I was like, whoa. People face situations that we can't give them a one, yes. this is, you know, we have to work through stuff and we, we just can't give them a scripture verse and say that's, it's a process, life is a process, right? So it's not easy but we have to find our way out of the dark places in life and not let people keep us there. So anyway, there's a commercial that's going, went around on the Super Bowl, and I'm not going to name it because it'll probably get fat checked, but it's um, all about love and foot washing. And I'll just kind of say something, uh, Jesus understands us. Well, that's not what it said, but what does that mean? This is exactly about the self-love. This is what's happening. Yes. It's about universalism. Yes. It's about the one world Jesus, and it's about redefining Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's redefining Christianity so it's not about the Lord. It's not about picking up your cross, denying yourself, mm -hmm. but it's embracing everything and everyone. And we've been talking about that for years, but it's... People were like, what was that commercial? Well, it was very mysterious. It was uh, who backed this up. Uh, this is the universalism we've been talking about. So the world is honoring self. And the humanist declares, no deity will save us. We must save ourselves. So this is a humanistic point of view. Humanistic psychology rejects the God revealed in Scripture. And they delve into the spirit realm, mysticism, and occultism. So you've got to be careful when you're starting to uh, seek counseling from certain people. What do they believe? Where is their roots? Are they 
into some of this stuff and that's what's going to come out in their counseling with you. Self is made into a God as having infinite potential, divine potential. And basically in the word of faith, you are a little God. You don't really need God because you are one. You have what you say. You can have what you want. Name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. So how did psychology get in the church? Many point to Norman Vincent Peale. He's not the only one, but he was the big one. He was a big one, and we know Robert Schuller studied underneath him. And psychology, what is it? It's the scientific study of the human mind and mental and emotional factors. So we're going into science of the mind now. And the Bible talks about beware of science, so-called. It's not really science, right? Because they can start passing laws saying this is human behavior and we all have to accept it now. And the churches have to accept this. They do not declare anything iniquity anymore because you don't want anyone to feel bad. So we can see the persecution that's coming, that's here in many places, of people that want to just basically teach the Bible. Uh, so this is very controversial in churches today, mixing men's ideas with the Bible. And it starts off with that. They got to mix in man's ideas and you got to sprinkle it with the Bible. But eventually what happens, they stop quoting the Bible. And it just becomes a man-centered alternative for dealing with man's problems. Colossians 2.8, it says, we are to avoid philosophies and deceptions of men, not to embrace them. We need to study to show ourselves approved. Even if you need someone to, sometimes all you need to do is you do need to talk to someone. You need someone that will listen to you. And that's why parents, you need to be available for your kids. Don't just, the average time that a father spends with his child is three minutes a day. How can you, impart anything three minutes a day. you got to be you had those kids be available for them talk to them let them talk to you be involved in their life let them come to you right and moms modern psychology's view sin is no longer considered sin but a problem or a disease a disease is something a person cannot control or is not responsible for so if you just claim something is a disease. This is just the way we are. Um, and I'm saying this because the things that they have on the horizon for our children, um, they need to be protected from minor, I'll call it minor, what they're calling it, minor attracted people. Um, and they want to push this. And this is my big thing is we have to see what's coming and not pretend this is not happening in our world. In Ma uh, Mark chapter 7, Let's look there. What does the Bible say about these things? Does he call it a disease? Mark 7, 21 said, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. What we watch, what we put into our mind, yeah. it's going to affect us. What we watch. Yeah. I know a lot of young kids that they started getting into the Playboys and getting it. Back then it was just a magazine. Now you can get it online and all that. It's going to affect you. And how it affects you is you don't need your wife. You don't need your husband. You just take care of yourself. Self-love. It's no longer about a relationship. It's all about you. And then you go to certain people and they'll tell you, that's fine, that's normal. Well, that's not what the Bible says. It says from within. And so we have to judge ourselves. And we have to say, am I making good choices? Am I allowing bad things to come in me and to come out of me? A good way to check your spirituality, and I'm going to get on a little horse here, is what comes out of your mouth. I know all the swear words in the world, but I don't use them. And why don't I use them? I can't stand it. I hate it when people pollute someone else's air and they disrespect how you think and feel. Besides that, it's, it's, there's not a fear of God. There's a lot of times I'd like to tell someone off, but I've had to discipline myself. 
as being a pastor at one time of a very large church with a lot of people made me mad, a lot of women upset me. People would chew me out for not going to their graduations. They're, you have no idea what people expect of you. And I'd have to just learn to be quiet, sit there and just take it. And that's discipline. And you have to discipline yourself not to blasphemy. And now these movies, all they are, are those bombs, those F-bombs, off and off. And off. And it, the Bible says, out of your mouth comes life and death. That's death. It's speaking death to people. Anyway, that's my little horse. My little high horse. Because it just makes me mad when people don't watch what's coming out of their own mouth. They don't even know how to control themselves, let alone other things. Because you've got to start with you, right? So hope someone gets convicted and repent. That's all we do. Repent, repent. Feels good to repent. Repentance is a good word. So this sinful behavior comes from within us. And we all have bad desires. We, all do. we aren't in heaven yet. So that's why we have to say no to the flesh. Not yes, what they're teaching us. Say yes. If it feels good, just do it. We no longer have sin and we can't repent. They're telling us we have diseases, so you can't change. That's hopeless. Well, you're just stuck with that. That's just, well, your parents were like that. You're like that. Now there's no hope for you. You're just going to be like that. You were molested, so now you're going to molest people. That's their thinking. It's just the way you are. But in Galatians 5.19, it says the deeds of the flesh are immorality, adultery, fornication, strife, murders. These are of the flesh. You can't cast out the flesh. These people now are trying to cast out the devil. Cast this out. Cast this out. No, you yield your flesh to it. And as you yield your flesh to it, the devil can get involved. So you have to stop yielding to it. Stop yielding to strife. I used to never like strife. Women, there was a lot of women at church and in school, way back in high school. I just didn't hang around them because they were, I don't know, I liked the boys better because they didn't get into all that strife and got, you know what I'm talking about? They just didn't care about all that stuff, and, you know. But there's a lot of people that are like, they're just stuck on strife and they just feel better if they put other people down than they got more knowledge about something and so much. It's the flesh. So anyway, we excuse and give someone no hope if we say it's a disease and he's no longer responsible for his action. And the more we do something, the more we like doing it because it's addictive. And then what happens is we become a slave to sin. It's controlling us now. We are not controlling it. Now we've given so much place to it. Now we've got major, major problems. Is there no hope? Well, no, there is hope. But we still have to know you're responsible for your actions. You're responsible for your words. You're responsible for what you do. When you drink and you drive, you could kill somebody. And I know someone that did. And I know someone that died by getting hit way back when they were a teenager. Drive, uh, some, they were drunk and they were driving. Someone else was drunk and they all got killed. It was just like, it's not worth it. You have to just see what could be. Look at the big picture, especially today. People are driving and they can't wait for the driverless cars. I wonder if we're already there because they don't know how to stop. They don't know how to go. They don't know how to, you know. But people are blaming the parents today. They're cutting their parents off. They're not having anything to do with the parents. And our parents suffered. Under World War II, our parents suffered. They all did. They all did probably the best they could. My mom was never home. I missed all that upbringing, I, I, I had to walk to school. When I was five years old, I did most of my stuff. Very independent, had to be, a lot of you guys too. But we don't blame them. They did the best they could. They were in sin. They were messed up. My mom had to uh, be a mother at 16 years old. And just on and on and on it goes. We live in a world where there's a lot of trouble. But what can we do? we got to keep our heart right, keep our conscience clear. Because once we lose that conscience and you keep doing something over and over and over, you can lose that ability of conviction. You All of a sudden, I don't feel bad about it anymore. And that's a terrible place to be with a seared conscience. And this is what the flesh does. So we could all say we had a terrible life, but it doesn't change where we're at now. We could all sit and feel sorry for ourselves. We could all sing, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's a... 
Nobody wants to hear your sad song. Have you have come to the, that's why you have to pay someone to listen because nobody else wants to hear it. <laughs> I forgive my alcoholic abusive dad. I have choices today. Um, I refuse to carry the bitterness. I've been bitter, I've been in unforgiveness and I've just chosen in my life, I'm not living that way. Because what happens is, and I'm not telling you, when you get hurt by someone, you're gonna have to make that choice all over again. Because it doesn't just, oh, I'm so spiritual now. No, it hurts, you're mad, you want vengeance. But we swallow the poison and then it, it affects us. It really does. We swallow the poison of unforgiveness and believe they're gonna die. No, it kills us. Unforgiveness and bitterness, anger. So we've all come from a mess and many love their sin, they don't wanna stop it. It's fun for a season. But what are we to do now as Christians? Okay, now all of us can all say we're, just, we're doing things we shouldn't do or we've done stuff we shouldn't do, but you gotta have a starting place. Okay, and we're all in different places. That's why you have to run your own race. You can't compare yourself to someone else. But we're to present our bodies as a living, holy sacrifice. It takes discipline to do that. It takes discipline. Romans 6, 12 through 14. Just read the whole chapter of Romans because he's the one that helps us get out of the slavery of sin. Romans 6, 12 through 14, don't let sin reign. Don't let it reign in your mortal bodies. Don't allow sin to control you and obey us lusts. Something about lust, the more you lust, the more you want. That's what covetousness is. I want it, I want it, I want it, and people will murder to have what they want and they didn't control their lust. Somewhere along the line, they gave place to the devil. They opened up the door. And somewhere along the line, we do too. We open up that door. And it's like a doggy door. You just can't get that doggy out. It keeps coming in there. So you gotta shut the doggy door and just say, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to that place. I'm not gonna hang out with those people. They cause me to wanna do bad things. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna shut the door to those areas in my life. Sound like a mom, aren't I, tonight? <laughs> but don't allow sin to control you and obey its lust. And lastly here, Satan's strategy is to make sin look natural, more uh, normal, and now make it scientific. Because the science says they cannot help themselves. So what do you have to do? Accept it. Normalize it. Pass a law. You speak against it, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. Hate speech. False teaching in 2 Timothy 4.3 says, we've been talking about that, but they, they itch your ears, they feed our lusts, and these false teachers, they get us full of coveting, mm -hmm. wanting more money, mm -hmm. wanting more of this, bigger houses, this and that. I, I'll turn preachers on that I used to watch in the 80s and 90s. I was like, people are still watching them. They have huge audiences. And the result of false teachers is do as thou wilt. Or it's all about me, mm -hmm. self on the throne. I want my way. I want to do this. I'm going to do this because of me. Well, as Christians, we're supposed to do as the Lord wills. We now have a different focus. It's not about us. It's about him. You have been bought with the price, right? So it's not about us anymore. And walk in the fear of the Lord. People are telling me, I'm scared of this and I'm scared of that and this and that. And I want to go if Jesus comes. I'm just like, live ready. Just live in the fear of the Lord all the time. Don't leave him and then come back to him and make a huge walk with him every day. Do the best you can to walk in the fear of the Lord. If we make mistakes as we do, turn around. Make adjustments. The Holy Spirit's there to help us. Not to condemn us and put us down and to say there's no... And that's what I used to love... My thing was I loved um, leading strippers and those girls to the Lord. We had quite a bunch of those um, people at our church. And <laughs> I just loved them because they wanted out. And, they, and if they fell, they would tell me, oh, I fell. And I'd say, okay, we're going we're gonna to get back up. And we're going to do this. We're going to make some changes. But the church nowadays doesn't give anybody hope. It's just the way you are. It's your problem. You have a disease or, you know, it's just this. The, you, there's no change. And people now don't have, they don't know how they can ever get out. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Norman Vincent Peale said there's many paths to God. He had the guidepost and he was pushing all this stuff many, and many people underneath him started pushing the same, there's many paths. And now we see that has bloomed into this big whatever you want to call it. But sound doctrine in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, what are we supposed to do? Feed the self? Glorify self? Deny it. Yeah, I'd like to tell you off. Yeah, I'd like to put you in your place. And tell me, I'm telling you, I come from a line of, I could do it. But I choose not to. Unless I'm pushed to that point. Quiet. <laughs> we say no to it. I could get angry. I could tell everybody off. Who wants to sit and hear you murmur? Control yourself. Can I be real nice? Shut up. Zip it up. Why? Because some people don't have a filter. No, you have a choice. You have a choice to stop it, right? Let him deny himself. How can I do that? Because the Lord's with you. The Lord, he's, he's given you his spirit. You can't do it in your own self. Lord, I lean on you. Help me. Keep my mouth shut. Help me, right? He will help you and he'll convict you. Let him deny himself, take up his cross. It's, it's heavy because you don't, we want our way. We want to do what we want to do, right? We always want our way. Everybody wants their way, but you don't always get your way. And get married and you don't get your way, right? But that's not a bad thing. Sometimes people go, I don't want to get married. I just want to have it's all about me and all this and that. And this is what we're seeing in our world now is the destruction of the family and we're seeing the children rise against their parents. And this is what the whole new system is. It's about destroying the family, and it's all about the state. It's all about the state. We won't get into that. Take up your cross daily and follow me, for whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Titus 2.11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. We are a peculiar people set apart. You don't hear sermons on this anymore because it's not popular. Don't touch, don't touch that sin. People won't come back. Live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He wants us set free from that stuff that's controlling you. It's taking all your money. Those sins cost a lot. He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a set-apart people, zealous of good works. These things speak... Speak them, exhort them, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So how do we do all that? Endurance. Mm -hmm. Endurance. How do we endure? Well, we endure with the Holy Spirit. We don't quit. We fail. We miss it. We've all blown it. None of us have a great track record. But we're in Christ. So if anything happens, my life is in his hands. I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God in this situation. I don't have to trust myself. I don't have to be my own savior. I trust in the Lord to help me grow, right? Endurance is knowing how to live under pressure. This is what we're going to have to do in closing for these last days. We're going to have to endure. Like Lot, he got vexed with the culture he was living in. We're vexed. I can hardly watch television. The commercials are just getting terrible. It's just like, really? You know, we're all about stink now? You know, I stink here, I stink there. I'm like, seriously? It's just gross. It's like stuff that we considered private back in the day is now everybody sees. And all these people running around their underwears and bra. It used to be soft porn. Now it's like, oh, just turn on television. But endure it's, this is the days of Noah that we're living in. And the Bible says, perilous times, the days of Noah, right? Endurance is knowing how to live under pressure, to be under and remain. 
So many times, I know you've wanted to run from situations, we all do. We got to remain. Mm -hmm. We got to abide. You want an exit, and God says, just stay the course. Stay the course. Stay the course. We make bad decisions when we don't endure. There's so many times back there in my life and all the life of my pastor friend wanted to quit the ministry. We did not sign up for this, but we stayed in it. Then there was times I wanted to leave and the Lord's like, you're not done yet. It's like a duty. It's like I need to be responsible to share with what I know. I don't need a title. I don't need a degree. I don't need anything but a voice crying out in the wilderness. Why? Because this Trojan horse that's invaded our culture in the church is going to pass laws and they want you to embrace them and not go against the narrative because if you go against what they're saying, they stop you, they silence you, and eventually, as we see, for hate crimes, they want to imprison people. Oh, that's not going to happen here. It's already been happening in other countries, and it is on the books, and it has been. And maybe it won't pass this time. But what happens? It comes around again. Yeah. And then we get another. Uh, if you don't know, the politicians are destroying our country. I don't care what side you think you're on. Uh, it's, it's a mess. But our hope isn't in government. Our hope is in the Lord, right? Our hope is not in the magic kingdom. Uh, yeah, it's getting totally crazy out there with the magic kingdom, but it, th right away they let you know it was a magic kingdom. And it's sad the kids can't go to places like they used to go. And I really feel bad for the children because what do they have to look forward to? We have to make something exciting for them as parents and grandparents. Be the best we can be. Do the, all you can do now. Instill in them stuff they're not going to get in public schools. Amen. And just be there because yep. our culture is changing and the church is changing. But Jesus Christ said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. amen. Everyone said amen. If you would like to see more messages from Roberta on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to her YouTube channel, Roberta Morrison, her backup channel, Roberta Morrison 2, and on the Living in His Presence Church website, where you can access the messages on the top center of the main webpage. There are free audio downloads of the messages. We are viewer supported. On the main webpage at the top right is a give button. Thank you for watching and see you next time.